Hi everyone, welcome to Foresight's Biotech in Health Extension Salon, sponsored by Hundred Plus Capital. Today we have a really, 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 really fun one for you. Uh, it's going to be quite practical and quite action oriented, uh, and it's a virtual clinic startup. And so, um, for those of you who remember, we had actually, I think, Max Moore joined us like at the 2017 Vision Weekend to talk to one of our partners, and then ha had a few discussions since. Um, and then Inga joined us uh, very recently with Ashwin to speak a little bit about why uh, one would sign up. We're still going to go through a little bit of like the why now, uh, but very, very brief for like 10 minutes or so. And then we really just uh, do tutorials and uh, afterwards, uh, for those of you who want to take your questions, because I think what is really exciting about both uh, Max and uh, Inga's projects is that um, they now have really amazing virtual ways in which you can sign up. And for those uh, of us who tried <laughs> earlier, um, you know, a few years ago, and that was always a really big one, uh, a big one to, to get going. So I'm super, super excited that uh, this is uh, finally available and very, 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 very um, excited to share with you guys. And so this is also, uh, I guess, like some somewhat of a, a good provision for those of you who are watching on uh, on YouTube um, in the sense that, um, you know, we really want to do these, do these uh, potentially uh, quarterly. And so one uh, fun thing that could for all of this is actually getting sign-up bodies and so forth to actually and make the process much easier. I know I signed up only because I had a sign up buddy. Otherwise, I would, just still be, I would still be a quiet procrastinator. Okay, let's get into it. Really, really excited to be joined by Max Moore and Emil Pinsora here from Alcor and from Tomorrow Bio. And um, yeah, I think you can just perhaps introduce yourself for just a hot second uh, and maybe your take on Phoenix um, and why do you think it makes sense? Uh, maybe Max, you start. Okay, why it makes sense to sign up to be a crisis? Um, yeah, I'm actually going to be giving a talk at the Alcor conference on June 3rd to 5th, which hopefully some of you will attend. It's our first one in seven years. And uh, what I'll be talking about is Cryonics as Plan A. For a long time, I, yeah, I have been talking about Cryonics as Plan B, and it was Ray Kurzweil calls it as Plan D, the first three being don't die, don't die, don't die. But I think actually it should be thought of as Plan A because you don't know how long you have. Uh, you know, some of us like to think that the singularity is coming and the singularity is coming and it will be saved in 10 or 15 or 20 years. Well, you know, I'm a little bit skeptical about that, but even if it is coming, it doesn't mean you can't have a heart attack tomorrow or be hit by a truck or get ALS or something else. And it does happen. I've seen way too many people I know fall like that. So uh, it really should be plan A. It should be the first thing you do because you can do something very dramatic to extend your lifespan by signing up for cryonics. It's a very concrete thing you can do and you can do it. And, you know, whereas life extension is kind of still rather iffy. There's not a whole lot you can do that makes a big difference or a few things to help not die early. But cryonics is something you can do, and so you really should do it. There's a big payoff. And the younger you are, of course, the more sensible it is to do this because it's less expensive with, with life insurance, which is how 95% of members pay for it. Uh, so that's kind of the basic way you should do it because I do think it has a good chance of working. I'm not one of those people who says, well, it's maybe a 1% chance, but it's still worth it. I think actually the chances are a heck of a lot higher than that. Uh, if you're cryopreserved under good conditions, I think the evidence shows that you're still intact. Uh, I think it's practically inevitable, unless we destroy ourselves, that we will develop the technology to repair and revive patients. And so it's really just the uh, the odds are, well, how likely am I to go under, under, under good conditions or bad conditions? Uh, will the organization survive? So that's really what limits the, uh, the figures below 100%. So I think it's a good chance. It's something you can do. So you really should do it. And we've been around for 50 years. And... Uh, Emil, not quite as long, but he's certainly you know, learned from the history of cryonics, I think. So uh, I think we have a good shot at surviving. Uh, so I think that's really why it makes sense and why you should do it. Wonderful. Great. That's a great pitch. Uh, Emil? Uh, yeah, yeah, I don't think I think have to have anything fundamentally new to say. Uh, I think Max pretty much sums it up. I think so. So when, when people reach out to us and, and kind of, you know, in, in the process of figuring out if this is for them, Right. So I think I think the fairest thing that you can say is, yeah, sure, it's an unknown probability. But then again, if if the value proposition of living longer or more precisely, potentially living as long as you choose to live, this is something that from a value proposition standpoint standpoint is interesting to people. Um, I mean, depending on what the age of the person is, then it's just a question of are you willing to pay whatever the amount is for the term life costs per month? Right, and, and if, if this is then a positive, a positive, you know, calculation for someone, then I think it, indeed it does make sense to to sign up, and it probably also makes the sense to sign up relatively early because you might get hit by a car tomorrow, right? Um, 
and, and, and of course, I tend to agree with the analysis that um, it's not super the probability that there will be any maximum life extending technology around anytime soon. is not pretty high, because otherwise I would work in that field. That's actually the field I come from. Right? I'm, I'm a doctor and then the cancer research should go into that field and then decided to join um, the cryopreservation uh, field because just I, I, I don't see any significant or, or I, I don't th think there's a significantly high enough chance that there will be maximum life extending technologies around anytime soon. Um, yeah, so I think if, you know, if, if you're interested in the value proposition, I, mean, I still have my fingers crossed that I just need to take a pill 20 years down the line and never need to be cryopreserved, but I want to be damn, damn sure that if it comes to the case that I need to be cryopreserved, that, well, then I have a contract in place. Wonderful. Or well, supposedly you also have a family, right? For whom that may not, 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 not come time. But um, I think one thing uh, that I would like to get uh, also for that is that what is the, you know, number one, uh, you know, fact that you, you just think is, uh, is a public myth? Right about this, like if you just went to myth busting, I'm sure that people are now, you know, uh, for those um, people who's new, have a million billion arguments, and you've probably heard them all. Like, what's the number one that often comes up, and what would you say to counter it? Someone needs to be due to that. Yep, getting on it. All right. Is that for email or for mail? Oh yeah, sorry. Uh -huh. Both of you. Okay. Well, it's pretty hard to pick a number one. There are you know, several that come up very frequently depending on the person. Um, I think actually among people who think, uh, talk to me about it, I guess actually one of the number one things is kind of peculiar because it doesn't involve cryonics not working, it involves cryonics working. And I think maybe the biggest thing for most of the population is, oh my God, this might work. And I'm terrified of the idea of coming back, you know, 100 years in the future where everything will be different, so I'll be... I won't have the skills. I won't know anybody. Oh my God, that's a terrifying idea. I find that kind of hard to relate to because I go, cool, this is going to be great. <laughs> yeah, I need some time to adjust, but uh, I kind of like the idea. But I think actually it's the most scary thing to most people. Um, yeah, there's always the population questions and order questions and all that kind of stuff. And I think that's probably number one. Uh, yeah, yeah. In population, I think I agree. In population, that's, or, or at least these kind of things. So, so I think it, it the, the number of one issue really depends on how far along the thought process people are already. So I think if people are interested in this topic or generally open for the topic, I think then the first topic is usually it's too expensive. I can't afford that. Um, if, if people are a bit further along the way, um, then it's why should I do this now? Right? I could very well do this in, in, in 10 years, in five years, and then sometimes also next month, next year. Um, and I think in the, in the general population, I, I'm, I'm I, I would even say it's probably um, uh, I, I'm not sure if I even want that. I, I don't think it's, I don't, I don't want that. I just, it is, I haven't thought about it enough to, to know if I, if I want it. And, but then again, um, this is not a topic yet where we can even reasonably talk about general population or anything like that, right? We're talking about like, like a, a lot of zeros before, before the percent sign, um, what we're currently discussing. And I think in these groups, it's mostly either I can't, I'm not sure if I can afford it, um, or I, I can do this later. Okay, wonderful. Um, is there any reason you know that you think is actually like a valid one why people wouldn't want to sign up? You know, like if you now go to like website steel man on the other side, is like there any bit of like okay, well this is actually like well, a, a, a good reason to get some chance not to sign up. Yeah, you hate living. <laughs> you hate living, and you're pretty sure you're always going to hate living. That's probably a good reason not to sign up. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's definitely one. Um, apart from that, I mean, so, so I mean, I, th I think that, that can, that you, can, you can make a case if, if your personal value system is somehow structured in a way where you say, hey, I value things, you know, it costs money, right? I mean, this, there's, no, there's no denying that, uh, where your personal value system is somehow structured in a way, a way that you, you can achieve, that, achieve something better with, with the money that you would spend on, on, on cryopreservation. I mean, that's at least a fair alg argument, right? If, if, but then again, I think for everybody who's interested, they, they value their experience and their life quite highly. And, and for them, it makes significantly more sense than buying an expensive car or something like that, right? And I think if, that, if that's the case, and I don't think there's any easily steel manable arguments um, against it. I'll just add to that, because it's an important point. So a lot of people will say that, well, I could spend this money helping poor people. Well, 
Are you going to? No, you're not. Almost in every case, that's not the case. It's just a yeah. rationalization. You're not going to go send all the money to the poor. You're going to buy a, a nicer house than you need, a nicer car than you need. You're going to go on vacation. So stop bullshitting us and giving us lousy, false excuses. <laughs> okay, great. Um, perhaps, you know, um, just, and I know we can't do this justice here in time, but, but like just that people are aware of a little bit like, what is the process involved now? Like just roughly. And where could we be, in, you know, like what, what are a few of the challenges that we still need to figure out along the way, right? Um, but where could we be perhaps in the future? Like what, what, what is the current process? And then, you know, a little bit of a future outlook of what, where do we still need to make progress on for actually a revival to be. You say process, do you mean the sign-up process or the process of doing the Grand procedures? Um, uh, of doing the procedures. Uh, we're getting to the uh, sign-up process in the second where uh, you know, okay. we're, we're going to have a proper walkthrough, but just, you know, what, what is the... What does the process entail? If, if people are like a little new to Primex, what does it entail now? And then what do we still need to make progress on uh, in the future for uh, the revival to, to a first movement? Okay. Um, well, I'll give a quick one on that before Emil talks about how it might be different where he is, but it's kind of a generic process. And then there are obviously variations depending on where you're situated and what happens. But the basic process is that there's really three main stages, I would say. The first one being SST, which we call uh, Standby Stabilization and Transport. So basically getting to the patient, hopefully with advance warning, staying at the bedside, uh, upon legal death being declared, transferring to the gas bath, doing the cooling, the medications, trying to keep the tissues viable as much as possible, and then transport back to the, uh, the, the cryonics facility. So that's really the first stage. Uh, the second stage is the, to remove as much blood from the patient as possible, because it's basically got a lot of water in it uh, and in the cells. And you want to remove that as much as possible because it's a cryoprotective solution. So instead of freezing, you actually vitrify the patient if you've done it well. Um, and then uh, you go into the rapid cool down and the slower cool down. And then the final stage being long term storage in the cryogenic viewers. I guess the fourth stage would be you know, eventual repair and revival. Now, it does differ a little bit if you're a local patient, for instance, if you move to Scottsdale in our case. Um, into a, a hospital or hospice there, we can actually skip the uh, the remote state, some of the remote stabilization steps, the blood wash out, we go straight to cryoprotective diffusion. Um, we'll also do that in overseas cases. We'll, uh, we'll just, actually, we'll do something a little bit different. We'll do uh, sort of a portable operating room procedure where we'll do the cryoprotection locally and then bring the patient back on dry ice, but otherwise it's pretty much the same. Yeah, yeah. Logistically, it works, it works quite similarly. Um, I think I think one of the main differences that we do in 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 practically all cases, uh, we do um, the cryoprotection procedure. So, meaning the perfusion of the cryoprotective agent um, and then deeper cool down. Um, we do this on site, um, and, and not we we don't transport patients on 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 in higher temperatures over longer period uh, or longer stretches. Um, basically, we have these mobile operating rooms. Like there's, for example, one. Uh, it's only half on the image, but um, it's basically retrofitted ambulances um, that we have in in multiple locations around around um, Europe and adding more. Um, and then and then one one difference is that that, that we only so far uh, cover the the European like basically Europe um, to be able to to respond quicker to cases and have less less uh, logistical logistical challenges. Because that, that I think is one of the biggest biggest issues right now in in cryopreservation look, practice, is that um, there aren't enough teams around the world to be able to to um, to respond quick to to cases um, if they're far away, and far away already means a couple of hours. Um, so so we we limit our we limited our our basically operation area coverage area um, until we have we have good coverage there and. Yeah, we, we might we might cover the US as well soonish. So if someone is in the US, um, then you know, soonish. Um, at least in certain certain cities, uh, we will we will have teams as well. Um, and and the rest basically on transport back to the facility and then cool down to cryogenic temperatures. Um, that's pretty much that's pretty much the same. I guess I should add on these on national front. You know, hopefully we'll work out some uh, cooperative agreement with Emil. So if we have members there and if he has members here, we can uh, help each other. Yeah. And we've been Absolutely. doing we've been kind of doing that in that we have uh, Cryonics UK. And we've had a number of cases in the UK, and that's both kind of a CI and alcohol service organisation. And they, you know Tim Gibson there is really good. He does regular trainings, and he's very very good and pretty exceptional because it's very hard to keep people coming to regular training sessions. So we have some local groups around, but they're really not qualified to do most of these procedures. Um, that's one reason that we contract with both international cryomedicine experts and suspended animation, so we can send that teams to 
uh, different states and even different countries. Without wanting to go on a tangent, but aren't there trainings? I, I heard that Alcovis needed one or is, is about to do one. I... Uh, we do some trainings. We've done trainings in New York because Ashwin has got a pretty active group going on there. Um, we do some trainings in in the in the Bird of Roots, a special team, but uh, we're not generally training up teams to do the whole procedure because we found that just not really practical. You really need people who are professionals at it, uh, who you can send out there. You can get people to do some very initial procedures, um, you know, very very minor things uh, to get things started while the team's coming, but you really need to have you know ready, regularly trained teams to do the procedure. Yeah, we need many more people in the field. So if you're a scientist listening to this, um, or if you're just a person really seeking to help, there's a lot to do, I think. And a lot of really, 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 I think, interesting opportunities to plug in. And I think if there's one thing that is super exciting to me, is just how much recent interest critics really has gotten in the scientific community. Uh, I really feel like, you know, this is like quite the watershed moment uh, where many people that I think, you know, uh, kind of like already in the back end paid a lot of attention over the past years um, and are now really coming coming into this field. And, and so it's, it's an exciting time, I think, to, to be working for us. Um, and I'll send the back, just to comment on that, because that, that's an important point, I think. If you look at the uh, Society of Cryobiology, this is a very interesting thing, because for many years, it was actually uh, against the, the, the bylaws of the Society of Cryobiology to be involved in cryonics. They could actually throw you out, ruin your professional career, basically, you know, make it published again. That has all changed now. We, we now have, uh, as president of the society, we have Gregory Fay, who's, you know, who's also a cryonicist. We have people on the board of directors who are very cryonics friendly, and that has been removed from the bylaws. So uh, that's a pretty big sign of a change. Yeah, wonderful. I'm really glad that Greg's out there and, and, and yeah. Um, so I think one thing, uh, just, you know, and, and, and I know that we're nearing the 20 minute mark, I wish we want to start the sign up process, but, uh, you know, if you could give people a little bit of an understanding of, you know, what still needs to happen on the scientific levels, like what are the biggest bottlenecks right now that we need to figure out over the next, you know, a few years, if you want the, the environment to be smoothly. Like, for example, if I was a new scientist working in the area, what would I focus on uh, if I wanted to get in and help? Well, I think one area would be cryoprotectant toxicity. You know, we've made some big strides in cryoprotectants over the years. We switched about 20 years ago from uh, fairly high concentration glycerol solutions to full vitrification solutions, which means basically we can eliminate all ice formation under good conditions. But we still have the problem of uh, cryoprotectant toxicity. Um, that means there's a certain chemical degree of to toxicity to the cells, which, you know, if you understand nanotechnology, probably isn't, isn't too desperately bad. Uh, it's not destroying structure, but it does mean there's a lot of work to do. So uh, it would be very nice, especially to demonstrate to the public that you can actually take whole human, human organs or small animals and actually reverse the process. You're not going to do that until you've solved the toxicity problem. Uh, it doesn't mean that clients, it doesn't make sense in the meantime, but it makes it harder to, to convince people. So that's probably one of the main technical ones. I'll turn it over to Emil to give his thoughts. Yeah, so I think the list is it's, it's pretty long, not unfortunately, but I think there's a lot of devil in the details problem, right? From from ischemic, from ischemia to toxicity, of course, to non-ideal ultrastructure preservation to there's still some isolation here and there, right? Even in in, in pretty good cases, um, and then also very practical things, just how to do perfusion, how to do it fast, right? Um, so that, that's a that's a couple of things. Um, none of that matters. It, none of that means that it doesn't make sense to sign up yet, right? The procedure is still, you know, you know we'll we'll see what can be repaired in the future. Um, but, but so 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 my point of view here is I, I'd much rather over prepare like crazy and then someone in the future tells me, hey, you could have stopped 20 years ago doing research, right? You know, this this worked already much earlier than you thought. Um, then the other way around, and of course the other way around, I will not maybe I I might not I might never see the future, right? So so in in my mind, um, you know, my my next whatever 50 years or whatever how long the life might be, um. I, I plan to, or also the company and everybody. So, so significant over preparation, I think, is the way to go. Um, and if someone wants to join the field, um, it, it depends a bit on what what their skill set is, right? So, um, I, I think there's a lot of very very practical, tangible things, right? Not really research, almost. It's 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 more on the development side or applied research. And then, of course, if you go more into translational research, then it's these topics that we already looked at, like um, like ice formation, like toxicity, and so on. And then if you want to go more towards basic research, well, then we come at, you know, novel warming techniques, um, how might revival work and, and these kinds of things. And then, of course, touching very much also on, on, on nanotechnology research. Um, so I think, I think that's pretty much something for everybody. Um, I, I, think, I think the main thing here is if someone is motivated by the field and wants to get involved, there, there's, a, there's a tremendous amount, no matter what 
your background is, there's a tremendous amount of things that can be done. Um, yeah. So if someone is interested, feel free to reach out. We're looking for some researchers for, for our facility in Switzerland. Yeah. Wonderful. There is a really fantastic book um, that was just published, and I think you can access it from our board, uh, on cryostasis revival by Rob Freitas, and he's also in the Fawcett orbit. And I think he's giving a few really great concrete ideas on especially how nano medicine really can help uh, on this front. And it's definitely no, um, I guess, coincidence that I've never met as many people sign up to, uh, sign up to Chronic apart from as an, on an alcohol meeting and at Fawcett meetings. <laughs> Because uh, I think the overlap between you know why why nanotechnology and why uh, is is a big one. Okay, wonderful. Uh, I'm really glad that we sped through this, and there's a lot a lot more to say. Uh, you know, I think for those of you who are new to the field, Tim Urban wrote a fantastic book uh, that post on why chronics makes sense. Uh, just in, in case you know uh, there's still some doubts left, and I'm sure that you guys can also share a few resources. I know that I'm tomorrow by your end and an alcohol that you walk through a lot of the arguments. So. If people still want to, you know, want, want more info, then just go go to these websites. I would say, and um, you've done a really fantastic job at this busting there. Um, and, but yeah, maybe we can move. If we are, if for someone who is, would now be convinced, right, or maybe was already a little bit convinced before, has some some due diligence on this, um, then uh, what would they do to sign up? Sign up is always like I think a really big bottleneck. Um, for me at least, it was um, it was it, it was complicated and. Uh, I then proceeded to try to sign up my entire family and uh, and, and most of my friend groups uh, because the moment that you care, I think you 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 need others to care too, right? Um, um you don't want to. Uh, I think you know the, the future out alone. So you know if we could make it, you know, like a very sweet, succinct, uh, just like demo of like you know what would one, what, what are the steps that if someone was convinced would walk through to sign up, um, then I think we can now just you know perhaps we can just you know trial run the thing now. Um, and maybe, I don't know, uh, anyone has a preference to start, perhaps, and uh, what Ma uh, Maxi said earlier. So if you you want to give it a go, um, then and we can do a one-on-one, -on -one, just back-to-back, -back, how would one sign up uh, with your respective organizations? And I think then we're going to hit the hour, and if people still want to stay on for questions, I'm happy to stay on in this room afterwards. Um, and about maybe we just do the virtual walkthrough first. Max, if you want to uh, give it a go, feel free to. Okay. Um, well, in terms of the uh, kind of quick overview, I guess the, these days, it, between what we do and what Emil's group is doing, is kind of got a little bit more similar recently because we just very recently launched our online sign-up process, which should make things a heck of a lot easier. And uh, just on Monday, I went through that with our membership person. It took me about 20 minutes, or it took a little bit longer because I'm pretty familiar with the steps. Uh, but it means basically you can fill out everything, generate the forms very quickly. There are still a couple of forms that need to be witnessed, uh, witnessed in person, and you have to get those you know, signatures done physically and, and scan them in. But it's really a lot easier than the good old days. Well, when I signed up, actually, we had a huge stack of paperwork <laughs> that, that big, literally, with four copies of everything that had to be all signed and witnessed. Uh, so it's like a lot easier. Uh, basically, the, the thing that takes the longest, really, uh, once you've thought about it, is the, the life insurance, which can take you know, a couple of months for them to just to process that. Emil, do you want to add anything that's different on, on your end? Uh, yeah. By, by, if you want to do show and tell, we are, I'm more than happy to, of course, do that as well. Um, so, 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 so for us, um, the process is, it's so, so we basically, so when we started out, we said, Hey, one of the most difficult things why people don't sign up is actually the sign up process. Um, you know, when I'm in the U S I'm still an Alco member. So I signed up with Alco, so I actually know the process, right? It took me a while and not, not like crazy long, but it took a while. And so, so for that, you need to, of course, very, be very, very intrinsically motivated. So I, I can quickly show you how it, how it works how it works for us. So let me quickly share my screen. And I'll, I'll show you for a second, right? And um, so if anybody's in Europe, feel free to do follow along. If you're in the US, I would recommend signing up with Alcor, but use our discount code, right? <laughs> um, if if you want to, and then sign up with them. Um, so so for us, it's it's pretty straightforward. First of all, um, if someone is not sure yet, we're more than happy to reach out to us, right? You have all the contact options and all of that to to just talk to us, and then we'll walk you through the steps uh, with with as much support as you might need. Otherwise, it's just you you click sign up, right? And then um, you you enter just a couple of things, right? You give us your age, um, you um, you let us know if you already have any type of funding in place. So this whole sign up here is is supported supports term life insurance um, as as a you know in, integrated into the system. Of course, a couple of people might want to uh, fund their cryopreservation um, plan, cryopreservation contract through either uh, whole life insurance or other types of, of funding methods. So all of we will support all of them, but um, then you need to there's there's like a small you need to we need to do this manually currently. 
then we have an extra research support staff. You give us your email. Um, and if you give us your email, then you already are done with the first steps. I mean, we collect where you, where you know us from, um, just for, for understanding where people find prior preservation uh, companies. Um, we give you kind of a ballpark estimation what your term life uh, insurance might cost. Um, of course, this depends on on the uh, on a medical check. So this is just a you know kind of a, a range that people have an idea what they might pay. And then once you're done with that, you you just you you you, you can you, you basically sign up for for membership. Um, this is just just a membership uh, fee. Let me quickly. Um, I mean, so so there's a. There's a, um, a discount code, which only works for the day. So, so you don't need to try this tomorrow. Um, and then again, you, you, you put your email address to confirm, um, give your, give your name and, uh, what language you want to sign up with and, and so on. And just for, for simplicity's sake, we do this very quickly here without really any, without any real data. Um, we support signups in, in, in German, in English, in French, in Spanish, and Italian. Um, any address, and then you you already are ready. You can pay with PayPal, you can pay with credit card, you can pay with direct um, direct debit. Um, Can you fill in your credit card there, Emil? Say again? Could you fill in your credit card, please? I, I will, I will. <laughs> and, uh, if anybody wants to sign up, <laughs> Um, no, I'll, you know, it, it, you can, we can direct debit it's from our, from our, um, bank account. And for that, I'll quickly, <laughs> I'll quickly stop sharing. So to just skip that step step and then directly after we can, we can go again. Now we are already fully through to the, to the first step of the, of the process and basically, well, screen sharing. Now we go, right? And basically now it tells you, hey, you know, now you're you're already a member with us, right? You haven't signed your contract yet though. So, you know, if something happens to you tomorrow, then well, this might not, this might not uh, be everything you need to do. And now we email you and basically first tell you, hey, okay, your, your sign up, oh, that's not the right email. Um, that is, right? We've received your payment, you're all good. And we directly email you um, um, a contract that you need to, that you can digitally sign. So that's the, the whole cryo preservation contract and a couple of steps. So this is not the right data because I just, I pre-prepared because the email usually arrives after two to three minutes and to make this a bit quicker, um, this is a pre-prepared version. So this is your cryo preservation contract and so on. So you can just sign that digitally and, and date it. And then you have your cryo preservation contract signed. So the cryo preservation contract here, um, is, is, uh, enables us to cryopreserve you should something happen. It has all the body donation contracts included and so on and so on. So now, of course, if you have chosen to fund your cryopreservation via term life insurance, then you will get afterwards, after this, you get an, 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 a form from an insurance partner that we work with, where you basically fill in term life insurance is an insurance that requires um, a medical check, um, a medical questionnaire because it's a risk insurance. So the insurance needs to understand if you have any pre-existing conditions or something similar. And if you, if you do that, then the insurance can give you the final price. So you would get an email that has, has this, um, this form, and then you fill all your, you fill all your, um, your, your information, right? And then, um, once you do this, there's a good amount of, of medical, um, uh, questions. This is unfortunately always necessary I right, just to put some some data here um, okay so it's not being used for anything so it's uh, it doesn't need to uh, uh, well home address all right and now you have a lot of medical questions right um how, where do you work how, how do you have any any risk factors are you a smoker which is a very important question and so on and so on so so that takes around let's say you know 15, 15 minutes or so, if you have your medical uh, information at hand. And once, once you're done with that, then the whole process is done and you are one of our members, fully funded, fully secured. The insurance usually takes, I think the best, in the best case scenario, uh, we had a confirmation from the insurance that the, that the insurance is, is accepted. It was like 20, 25 hours or something like that. 
Um, but that, of course, is if there's no medical pre-existing conditions and so on and so on. Um, it can take a couple of days. Um, in very rare circumstances, it can take a week or or ten days or something like that. But that's pretty rare. Um, by and large, it's pretty it's pretty quick to go through the process. Um, now, two things that we cannot do digitally um, is a patient advance directive, and I mean, of course, that depends a bit on country. But um, we require the patient advance directive and um, a last will. Um, that needs to be handwritten or 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 notarized. Um, but technically, the cryopreservation in Europe can be done without either. So you don't need a last will. You don't need um, a patient advance directive. But we very very strongly recommend to to put in place both. Um, it's just not integrated in this in the in the system because well you need to do it you need to do it manually. Um, but our team is gonna it's gonna remind you regularly um, to get around to doing it so that it's actually then in place. Um, yeah, so the whole process signing up with us is, I, I don't know, depending on if you have your medical information ready, it, it's a couple of minutes and then it's a couple of days waiting on average until you're fully signed up. Um, so, so, so the time to sign up is definitely not a reason to not sign up. Um, and again, we're more than happy to help you with either or with, with any of those steps, um, to, to walk everybody through and, and support as much as, as might be needed. And also, of course, answer any questions that might come up. Wonderful. Uh, well, it would be really fun. I mean, I don't think that anyone was actually fast enough to now speed along with it. Uh, but perhaps, you know, if we do these yeah, on a regular sure. basis. Yeah. But no, yeah. no, but, but, but mm -hmm. that wasn't the point of it. You know, it's just like walking through people through the motions, like this is what you do. But perhaps mm -hmm. a, a fun thing at the next one would be if we send people this video earlier uh, and then we can just troubleshoot uh, if they were stuck uh, at different places. Um, yeah. Okay, wonderful. Uh, Max, um, uh, how's the process for Alcor? We'd and uh, super super love to hear. Yeah, we can kind of look at the work form, but it is actually fairly similar to what Emil showed you uh, with our new system. So I don't need to go through all of that state, but I'm happy to do so in future. But basically, um, uh, let's see, first thing I need to say is, uh, what was I? Um, yeah, uh, the same thing. I just make a note. Uh, there are a couple of forms that you have to do. So uh, you can't do digitally the last will and testament and the consent for credit preservation will have to be signed in person. One difference is that um, while with EPF, it's kind of a, a life a term life insurance is the sort of default system. We actually don't really like term insurance. Uh, it's okay to start with, especially if you're young, because it gives you a lot of leverage, but we really strongly encourage people to switch from that to a different kind of policy like we uh, you know, universal policy, so, or something even like whole life, which is more expensive, but does give you some inflation protection. So uh, that's, you know, we don't think we like to them except for a temporary system, a uh, temporary fix. Um, yeah, okay, so um, this is just saying, just fill in your, your information. It really takes about 20 minutes, I found, going through it. Maybe a little longer if you need to decide some of the issues as to, well, you've already decided neuro, whole body, that kind of thing. There's a few other things where you have questions, like are you gonna be private or confidential? That's one thing you should consider ahead of time. Um, I you know, obviously strongly encourage people to be public because the more we're open about uh, their, our arrangements, the more it helps other people to see it as normal. So it's basically, I'm here, I'm cryo, you better get used to it. So I like to <laughs> play on the, uh, what the guys used to say. Um, so uh, let's see, yeah, you just scan the life insurance information. Um, we need a, either, with the insurers, I should say, we need either a collateral assignment or an irrevocable beneficiary for Alcor. Because we need to better check on the value of the policy, make sure you're still paying it. Because obviously, if we send a team out and spend a lot of money and then find out that the insurance is not going to pay out and then we have to figure out a cryo, that's a bit of a problem. So um, we were actually doing something different where we would own the policies. But it turns out because of uh, stupid government regulations, if you own the policy, they think Algo has all this money that we don't actually have. It, it counts that as our money, even though you know, we, can't, we can't get it without your permission. So, uh, we no longer do ownership of policies, we just do collateral assignments or revocable beneficiary. Um, um, I think there's I much think else that's really different than what, than what Demille said. It's pretty much just, just goes through, put your information in, it generates the, the agreement. Oh, I get, yeah, one important thing I should mention, because this is different than, than not too long ago. Uh, it used to be either you signed up as a credit reservation member or not really at all, maybe an associate member, which didn't mean a whole lot. Now you can sign up as, I think very much like a mail system, you can sign up as a member right away, not a credit reservation member until you provide funding, but it means you are a member, you get locked in at that rate. So if you are younger, you really want to lock in your membership dues because they're now based on your age. Uh, the younger you are, you're going to be paying longer, so you pay less. 
so it's good to lock in that. And then you can arrange your crowd preservation funding, even if that takes you somewhat longer. And then you can do that as a separate step. That, that same thing basically as on the meals website. Um, so that's a little bit different than we used to do. Wonderful. I think one interesting bit um, that you just pulled on is newer versus full body. And, you know, there's probably a few, for a few people that's news. Um, you know, do you just want to say the option? Like if I, I'm sitting there now and I'm considering my options, uh, you know, do you have like specific considerations that I should ask myself to decide first, what, what are the options? Uh, and then how would I go about them? Uh, with the neuro or body option? <clears throat> Yeah, we actually have something. If you go to the, the Elva website and the resources, it has a whole section on the neuropreservation option for people who you know, are a little bit puzzled as to why would I come back just as a brain. Um, yeah, my choice is neuro. It always has been. That just makes sense to me. And I think probably a lot of people listening to this would probably also get that pretty easily. The idea being that uh, yeah, who you are resides basically in the structure of your brain. Uh, it's not in your big toe. I don't know if anybody saw that Woody Allen movie, uh, Sleeper, where... The leader has been destroyed, but they still had his big toe. I think it's his big toe or his finger or something. And they reconstruct him from that. Well, of course, that's not the way it really works. You can't, you can you know, clone yourself, but that's not going to be you. So you really just want the brain. Um, and my view is the kind of technology we'll need to repair trillions of, of damaged cells, including, you know, however many neurons it is these days, 80 billion neurons. That kind of technology should be able to regenerate a body from your DNA relatively easy by comparison. You know, we're already starting to grow proto-organs. Uh, so I think that kind of thing will be relatively easy. Um, there's also some theoretical advantages to neuro in the sense that, uh, well, there's actually practical advantages in, in, in the US. Uh, getting across state lines is a lot easier if you're a neuro because it's considered a, a tissue donation, whereas a whole body, you have to get a transit permit from the health department, and that can sometimes be difficult and delay things. Um, you could also optimize for brain tissue, which seems like a good idea. Um, you know, there's a lot of arguments about how much difference that makes, but uh, that is at least a theoretical advantage. And of course, it's less expensive because you're stored in one tenth of the volume of a whole body patient. So that. Do, do, Sorry, do you ahead. know what's Do you know what's more common? It's pretty much. It's pretty close to fifty-fifty. I think. Uh, I think it's slightly more people sign up by whole body than neuro now, but it's pretty close to fifty-fifty among our existing patients. It's actually more like sixty-forty for neuro whole body. Interesting. Emil, do you want to make a comment on that? I don't know if it's... I mean, no comments. So, so we, we have a different... So, so we do whole body only. We don't have a neuro option. And, and, and the reason for that is um, that... Um, so, so I think one of the most important, most important long-term endeavors that, that the whole community needs to, walk, to walk, work towards is get, getting more people involved, right? Like um, when, I, when I say mainstream appeal, I don't mean mainstream in regards to, you know, 100% of population. But I mean, you know, let's say an order or two orders of magnitude, more people signed up. And even though I, I would medically, of course, agree the brain is the important part, right? It, it seems to be that maybe not in this group that is in the call right now, but if you go one step, one order, like, you know, if you, if you broaden our appeal a bit, then it seems to me that um, whole body is significantly more acceptable. It's easier to wrap your head around than just neuro, right? Um, and of course, Medically, I don't think this is this is really true, but then again, um, these decisions are not being made fully rationally, right? Um, especially if your family members are involved or if you're mixed, uh, yeah, I don't know, like your family is involved. Um, so we decided to go for neuro only. Uh, sorry, huh, don't have a neuro option. We go to whole body only. Um, and I think the other the other reason, at least from a perfusion standpoint, um, since we need to need to in most of our cases, since we cover Europe, we anyway have cross country transport um we need to we, we we anyway need any you know all the regulations or all the documents that are required for that um in our case it's not that problematic because we have since we're doing the full um cryoprotection on site and then already cool with dry ice we have basically time to do the transport because the body is already pretty well protected at at around um negative 80 degrees celsius about um yeah, so so that's that's why we decided it's a bit, it's a bit more expensive, of course, um, but I think there are, are a couple at least from a growth perspective. There's a, there are a couple of advantages. Um, uh, you gave me another great segue for both of you guys. Um, you know, I think we already talked a little bit at the beginning about the fact that, um, you know, it isn't as expensive as people think. Usually, like that is the number one argument that I get, and I'm like, I was able to sign up five years ago with a nonprofit salary, um, you know, through life insurance. Um, and so perhaps can you give people like just rough ballparks about like what that means? It obviously depends big time on the life insurance, right? Um, but I think just in terms of 
you know, uh, fees that are expected from your end and what people can kind of like gradually expect to run into, because I think that is a significant uh, consideration. Yeah. So, so we have, we have basically a two tiered kind of funding method, right? We have, you have, you have a, um, you have a membership fee, which is 25 euros per month. You pay that for the time while you're alive, right? So that's basically making sure that we can pay for the medical team that is on, like, you know, is being kept ready to go. Uh, for the equipment, for, for all of that stuff, right? For overhead things. And then at the time when cryopreservation needs to be performed, then in our case, there is, you need for whole body 200,000 euros that need to be available. Now, how that money is being made available, um, there are multiple options. I very agree, much agree with Max that um, term life insurance can only be a part of the solution. A good amount of people live longer than their term of the term life insurance runs. So I, 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 we, we focus initially on term life because we have a large amount of relatively um, young members. So our average member size, uh, member age, I think is 35 or 36, something in that range, right? For them, it's very, very easy um, to get very affordable term life insurance. I think our average member pays around 30, 31, or it might be somewhere between 29 and 31 euros on average for term life a month, right? So with slightly above 50 euros a month, you can sign up at a, as a 30 something year old, and then you have your term life until you have basically your funding in place until you're around 60 to 65. Now, of course, you need to need to plan for um, what happens after that. But then again, um, it's significantly easier for people who are older than 65 to fund large amounts or pay into, into insurances. You should, of course, start earlier. So we, we our, our CRM, um, we start actively reaching out to people 20 years before their term life runs out to make sure that they have then funding in place and that they're aware of it and have time to put money into, into whole life or any other type of uh, or, or, or a savings plan. But um, yeah, to, to start, you, you're, you're, you can start with around 50, 50 bucks a month, um, 50 euros a month, which is very similar to 50 US dollars right now. So um, it, it's, it's very affordable. Uh, and and I, I don't think that money is, is really should be a prohibitive, a prohibitive issue for at least a large percentage of population. Yeah, I agree. I think it's a matter of priorities. It's hard to give us, um, well, on, on the current preservation funding, I can give a specific number, but now that we switched to age based use very recently, I can't really give you a number. In fact, you have to ask us to generate that number based on your age. It's a certain formula for you know, a certain number times your age. So basically, if you're in your 20s or 30s, this membership use is going to be pretty trivial. Um, for the uh, current preservation funding itself, uh, that's $200,000 minimum for whole body and 80000 for neuro. However, um, you know, if someone's going to do that, I would recommend adding $20,000 of funding because that's nothing in terms of life insurance. And that way uh, you get a waiver of the comprehensive member standby, the CMS fee, which is basically what allows us to send a team out, you know, hundreds of thousands of miles away and stand by your bedside, uh, which could be quite expensive. So adding that, especially if you're younger, it's much easier to add that to your life insurance funding. Um, I would also note on the term insurance, one thing, I don't know if it's different in Europe, but one thing that's very important, if you get a term insurance policy, look very carefully at it and make sure they guarantee you to upgrade or change to a universal other policy without having a medical exam. Because if you have that medical exam and you've got some condition that makes you uninsurable, you are screwed. So you want to have that guarantee in there. And they, you know, many of them do that. So just check for that. You don't want a medical exam uh, requirement. Um, yeah, that's, that's not the issue. So in Europe, at least in Europe, in Germany, that's not an issue. Um, because the, the, the whole life, the, the types of insurance, they, they work slightly different in, in detail. Um, basically, the, 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 you know, the one that you would use for older age is basically a, kind of like a savings plan. So, so no, medical, no medical examination is needed at all uh, in any case. Um, but it works a bit, it works a bit different. Um, yeah. He's switching, he actually, from term, he's switching from term to like a... Index Universal, you don't need yeah, to... this doesn't really exist. So Index Universal doesn't really exist. Oh, well, that's what right. thing. Yeah. yeah. So you, you have you have term or you have whole, and yeah. there, there isn't really anything. These combined models, they don't really they don't really exist. You can um, switch to whole, but that you don't require exam for that. That's... No, you don't, because it's basically a whole life insurance is basically a savings plan, mm -hmm. right? It's it's not really an ins it's not a risk insurance. It's basically you have a savings plan that has this added functionality of being paid out to someone should you die, right? Um, 
and and that's that's so so we tend to also because whole life insurances and again this might be different in the in the US whole life insurances by and large are not good investment products like they usually underperform market right so if if you would do this very early on in your life right or if I would decide to take out that let's say at thirty right and then run this for let's say well another fifty years or or so with a relatively like with with generally paying in whatever a couple hundred um, euros a month, I can probably make significantly more money if I put it into some worldwide ETF thing. Um, so 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 it, it depends a bit on where you are, what your financial situation is, uh, how old you are, um, and and a lot of different factors. So that's why we decide. Okay, so we go primarily for term loss because this is very easy. You can protect your you can basically protect your yourself immediately, and then figure out all the other stuff out. Again, coming to the point that it's quite difficult and quite overwhelming already. And if you put some f complex financial product in it, um, it adds it adds the complexity. The only thing, and then we kind of see ourselves as or as part of our job as well to make sure that then people um, um, don't just say, okay, so now I have term life. Now I need, don't need to think about anything anymore for for forever, right? So that's a very important point. But for us, it's always easier if we if they're already our members, then we can annoy. Them right, we can annoy our members. We can call them. We can email them. We can make sure they do that stuff. Um, whereas if they're not the members, then of course we can't. We can't do any of that. Yeah, yeah I uh, think that's. I should just like add something because I think that's an important point that uh, Emil brought up. We all talk of life insurance. I, I like to emphasize that. I also I agree it's not a very good investment vehicle. So yeah, there is something nice about whole life. It kind of settled, but it's not really the most efficient way to do it financially. So, you know, you yeah. may not care too much about that if you have the money for it and you want to just settle your mind on it. But um, yeah, if you get that that basic funding in, in whatever form of insurance, and then think about, uh, you've got to plan for inflation. So don't think that once you signed up with 200,000 or 80,000 or whatever, you're set for life. You're not, you know, inflation's a big deal today. Uh, we start remember, oh yeah, inflation does exist sometimes. So you've got to allow for that. Uh, so yeah, by investing, uh, you know, paying a bit less life insurance and investing over time, um, I think you will do a lot better. Uh, we do have an option and I'll call it a permanent prepay where you can actually become a, you know, a lifetime member and prepay your uh, prior preservation now. Uh, and that actually will guarantee protection against inflation because we'll basically put it in the endowment fund, which is very good at uh, growing while maintaining ahead of inflation. So uh, that, that's also an option. Okay, wonderful. I'm, I mean, I'm glad to hear that you guys just uh, annoy the hell out of us. <laughs> that's really wonderful. That's exactly how I want it to be done because I know that you know, uh, yeah, you uh, life 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 gets in the way. So I think that's that's um, that's really nice to you. I think on the long run. Um, okay, um, um, we have a few participant questions. Uh, perhaps Abdul Kader, you want to go first? Uh, yeah, I I have several questions actually. Uh, uh, my first question is regarding revival. Let's say, for example, revival have twenty five percent of success. And uh, you are uh, working on the background that uh, the body could have permanent damage uh, or perm cause permanent uh, disability. So who will make that decision then to risk that revival or not? Yeah. Well, I, I think, do we go first, Emil? Oh, no, go ahead. Okay, I was going to say, really, the answer is we don't know, <laughs> because that's uh, you know, decades from now, and uh, we don't know who will be making that decision. There may be some you know, official board that has to rule on that, some kind of ethics committee. We don't really know what the rules will be. So uh, it's kind of hard to answer that. Uh, but you know, assuming it's the cryonics organization, uh, I have to make the point that, of course, first of all, before we do any revivals, we want to revive complex animals, cats and dogs and horses or whatever, to make sure we can do it properly. And presumably we'll have pretty good knowledge of what's going on in your brain. I don't think, you know, bodily disability is going to be an issue because we'll just build you a new part. So that will be the issue. But the issue might be if there's such a bit damage to parts of the brain that we're not going to be able to repair all your memories or personality, then it becomes a real issue. And that's something that is not part of basic paperwork. That's something actually would encourage you as a member to put in your wishes uh, as clearly as you can. Think through the scenarios and say, I don't want to be arrived at this condition or under that condition. Um, you have to decide that for yourself, and it's kind of tricky. Uh, you could even, like I know Saul Kent has a very elaborate sort of test for it being still him. Uh, we get hold of that, where he specifies all kinds of rules for deciding whether it's him before he gets his resources and identity. So, yeah, I don't know who's going to decide that, um, but put your wishes in there because we hope at least that whoever does that will listen to, to what you want rather than what yeah, the rules of the time say. 
I was wondering also legally, do you own the body or the body part? Who owns it after, uh, uh, during the cryopreservation legally? Well, in, in the US, we use the Uniform Anatomical Gift Act and essentially from the eyes of the law, you are not a person. Um, you are basically gifting yourself as a, you know, for scientific research. So we kind of own you, we own your ass, we could say, and the rest of you. Um, uh, but yeah. but the, that's not where we see it, of course, we refer to people as patients, we regard them as people, uh, as potentially alive people. And we do hope that at some point in the future, when it becomes feasible, we will be able to extend rights to our patients, just as people in long-term comas have rights. So that means if you uh, do a mistake, actually, uh, you have no liability whatsoever. Well, we do because we lose a lot of members and potential members if we you know, make a big mistake like that. So uh, that's actually why we, I thought we traditionally fought very strongly for our patients' rights. We'll go to extreme lengths, you know, spend lots of money on lawsuits if necessary to stop relatives from destroying our patients. Uh, so the liability really is reputation, I think. Yeah, maybe, maybe to briefly add to that. So, so of course, the, the other question, how that is being decided, that's speculation, right? So, so let me preface that, that speculation. I think, I think it's going to be less of an issue. So, because, so, so basically you say, hey, you know, there's only a 25%. I, I don't think you would, you would start trying to revive people out of 25% probability. You would do that. In my mind, the, the best solution is to start reviving people at the time when the, the probability of a successful revival is equal to a major operation right now. Right, so so pretty good. Still, stuff can go wrong, but it's it's pretty good. Um, and then the next point. Well, let's say let's say we there's a there's an attempted revival and it doesn't work. Then, I would argue that in most cases, then it would still be possible to cryopreserve that patient again. Right, basically, while the revival, you basically reverse the process and say, okay, so probably we might have accumulated some additional damage now due to the revival process. But now we just, in quotation marks, need to wait a couple of years, couple of decades longer until technology has even advanced further to then again try to another revival and repair the damage that we might have accumulated during the, during the, um, during the revival attempt number one. And um, wait at your expense. Yeah. Yes, that would be uh, that would be at the expense of, of the organization. But it probably will only happen in the first cases, right? So at, at some point you will get that good at doing the process that this will not happen anymore, right? So initially anyway, the first cases will be so expensive that it probably needs to be covered by, you know, some external research funding and so on, and not only by the funds that are available to the to the patient themselves. So I don't think this is gonna be much of a of an issue. Um, and to, to your second question, I mean, depending on where you are. So in our case, um, we are not. So, so in, in Europe, in, in Germany specifically, you're not, you cannot be the owner of a diseased person, legally speaking. So it, it, we are the foundation. So that's a nonprofit foundation becomes basically the guardian of that, of that patient, of that body. Right. So we're not really the, the owner per se. We are the indefinite guardians. Of, of that of that patient. Um, I don't think this has much legal ramification. It, it just, it's just slightly different. I don't think this means anything fundamentally um, or has any ramifications, but this is, this is maybe a, a small difference. Is it, is it more like a <laughs> cemetery or something like that? Um, so cemeteries kind of go with, uh, it's it not, it not like a cemetery, right? Cemeteries are a different legal structure. Um, it's it's very similar from a legal standpoint. Um, what what Max said with it's it's a it's a research donation or it's a body donation to research, and then cryopreservation present per in, in itself is a research project. So the fact that you are being cryopreserved is a research project until the research project ends at the time once you're being revived. Thanks. Um, I think. Um, it, it kind of depends on just, you know, how impatient you are, you know, and I think you can, uh, you can specify that, uh, I guess on, in, in your will as well, right? Like what, at what point would you want others to attempt to revive you, right? Uh, to some yeah. extent, you know, so that, that's a little bit, I think uh, also up to, yeah, so, to so, the subject. We, yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry. I, yeah. So, so, uh, sorry, uh, maybe the last one, what you said, um, um, we allow, we allow wishes as well. So you can say, Hey, you know, I want to be rather in the, in the first, I want to be a bit later, whatever. Right. Um, I, I think it does not make much sense to have those wishes legally binding because I, I think there's a, rel a relevant risk that people put certain wishes in how their revival should work 
and then these wishes might never become true, right? And then we we're in a, in a weird situation where we have already revived in extreme circumstance, everybody else. And then you cannot be revived because you have these legally binding wishes, how you want to be revived. And for whatever reason, the revival procedure just works fundamentally different than we imagined, I don't know, a hundred years ago, right? So I think legally binding is, is quite difficult. I think it makes more sense to say, okay, we have, we have a common understanding why we do this thing. So our contract includes basically a common understanding why we do cryopreservation. And the idea is, okay, well, to, to live again in the future with personality, memory, and so on, and so on intact. And now you can add some wishes. Um, but if, for example, another type of revival becomes possible, the, the common understanding supersedes those wishes. Um, Wonderful. Yeah. That's, that, that, that's a great... Um, that's I think great. This is one thing actually is important to comment on there, Emil, is uh, one kind of wish, I, I agree with the general point, you don't want it to be too restricted and legally binding because you might never come back. But one important thing is, um, you know, if one option in the future might be instead of reviving you biologically, but to scan your brain and produce an uploaded version of you, that is something you probably want to specify because I know people who think they will be dead and that will be a copy of them and it wouldn't be them. I don't actually see it that way, but if you really do, then you want to put that in your wishes. Do not upload the only you know, physical biological revival. Yeah. But even there, oh. it's a problem, right? Let's say, let's say biological revival becomes possible, uh, or or one of one of the other options becomes possible. And since now one option is possible, the other option is not being researched anymore, right? Because for ninety nine percent of the people, either one is fine, and then you have made a choice, and you're not being revived, right? So so, I, I think it's it's very very difficult because um, because we, we're trying to make legally binding things for so far in the future. Um, that that where we don't know how the world will work, what technology technologically will be possible, and so on. It, it, I think it's a very difficult topic. But the wishes are not legally binding today because yeah. people are not recognized as people, so it really is just wishes at this point. But yeah, they, could... they may kind might become legally binding. Yes. Yeah. Well, without wanting to put too much, um, you know, uh, too much of a segue into this, but Nick Zabo has this contract or uh, this concept of a video contract by which. You know, uh, it's very difficult to make uh, contracts now that are legally binding in the exact way which in the future. But if you could record a video and that provides a little bit more context of just like what it is that your priorities are, and it gives um, those that make the decisions a bit more room to interpret what you actually want uh, and in a time where it's still relevant. But yeah, those are difficult questions. But at least, uh, you know, um, uh, I, I, once you're at that point, um, I think you're at least like safe enough that you have signed up. Uh, and, and now it's just like, you know, figuring out these details, which are important, but um. But I think, uh, yeah, this this seems um, bits first. Is, uh, I think Kai had another question here. Yeah, good uh, good to see you guys. Um, I'll be at Alcor's 50th, so uh, it'll, it'll be good to meet a little more formally. Awesome. Um, Emil, I think we're actually going to be at the Foresight event a little before then, too. So. Cool. Awesome. Yeah, but uh, so I, I one of my questions was for Max, I think he already answered it, was uh, what's the workout routine? So um, maybe I'll, I'll send you an email and you can give me some more uh, uh, details. That'd be, that'd be fun. But um, my, my main question was um, if you guys have any thoughts or opinions on persiflation and if either of the facilities are doing any research in that area um, as a possible route around the cryoprotectin toxicity problem and a few others. So um, yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, so so persiflation is, is super interesting. Um, um, it, it, it's so so we're not doing research on it, right? And and the reason for that is I think there are significantly more low hanging fruits. So so it, it is it is very it's very it's it's very interesting, but it's probably it's gonna require a good amount of additional research funding, not necessarily basic research, but at at minimum translational or applied, right? So this is not something that you can implement anytime soon. Whereas on the other hand, there is a good amount of stuff that you can implement with relatively low hanging fruits um, and you don't need, you know, and you can improve the quality of an average choir preservation much faster than with, with these advanced, relatively advanced techniques, right? Um, but from a, from a fundamental standpoint, I think this might be, um, this, this, this might be, so, so let's say 20 years from now, right? It, it might be, it might be one of the breakthroughs that at some point will be implemented into, into the field. But it, of course, this is difficult to predict. Um, yeah, yeah. So, because I think uh, I think the, the important point here is right. The average cryopreservation is not being done under lab conditions, right? So, it's, so it's very possible that persiflation for persiflation is is great under lab conditions, but there are things that are great under lab conditions. But the second 
you 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 go to non-ideal conditions, which basically every cryopreservation to 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 varying degrees is being done under non-ideal conditions. Then what works best in the lab might be one of the worst options under non-ideal conditions, right? So all of the research and development we do, we always assume um, we're going to have currently average conditions. So what's the best procedure under these average conditions? Um, and, and only at the time when you can say, hey, we have a reasonable assumption that we can improve the the, um, the average conditions, I think then you can think about, okay, so what works well in the lab and how can we implement that? Yeah, I'd agree with all that. I, I also mentioned that uh, we actually invited a proposal on the post inflation, but we just didn't get a sufficient proposal to, to fund that, but you know, that, that remains open. But this kind of an alternative, one thing we are working on that uh, people have worked on for 25 years without making it work, but I think finally our, our technical genius, Steve Graeber, is making it work, and that's liquid ventilation, uh, which will also provide much more rapid cooling. The basic idea is to introduce perfluorocarbons into the lungs and use that as a heat exchange medium to very rapidly plunge in temperature. And that's something I think has a pretty good chance of working and could definitely be done in the field. Steve has managed to miniaturize the whole thing and make it more reliable. So uh, we should have some announcements about that fairly soon, hopefully. Cool. Wonderful. Um, yeah, I just shared the um, more info on the ALCO conference. For those of you who are watching on YouTube, um, the ALCO conference can be found through the ALCO website. Uh, it's coming up soon, uh, and it's on June uh, 3rd and 5th in 2022 at the Scottsdale Resort in Scottsdale, Arizona. Uh, Emil will also be speaking there, and, and uh, there's a little bit more also on financial planning in the face of inflation, uh, and then a little bit more on the technology too. So if you're interested in that, uh, then I would recommend uh, they check that out. We actually had the very first yeah. ever president's panel where we have, uh, it's going to be Emil, Patrick, Dennis from CI, and Peter from Australia. So it'll be the first time that people from like four different organizations and leaders have come together, which I think is pretty interesting. It's got to be a big, big fight. <laughs> we, all, we all like each other a lot. That's all. That's all. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. So um, I know that there's uh, like one more question. I don't know, uh, like maybe we can just get, get, to, get to one more. I thought this was an interesting one. As speaking about legal limitations and societal conditions, have you ever considered a solution where people who sign up are quite preserved and permanently sent to a place in the solar system where cold temperatures can be naturally present? This will avoid all societal constraints and the individual is preserved until revival is possible. <laughs> yeah, so we get that question sometimes. Why don't we just put it in a geostationary? Um, yeah, the, the, thing, the thing is, I think the, you know, the extra complexities it's similar how people are always excited about putting a cryopreservation um, storage facility in, in like a, in a bunker, like you know, in the in the Swiss Alps and so on. You know, it's, this is all this is all great and and good ideas, but um, it, it's only a good idea if if someone says, "Hey, here's a hundred million, right?" Um, before that, it's it's I think it's it's more an interesting thought experiment. It, I think it's the logistical complexities are just so much larger than any meaningful meaningful advantage. If we get Elon Musk to sign up, maybe he can work on that component of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, more than happy to yeah. yeah. Wonderful. Okay. Well, we I think we really tackled all from like near term conservation to the very, very long run. Um, and yeah, I'm super, super excited that you know there's like so much activity now in the space. Thank you so so much for joining. I hope this wasn't the last time. Like in my ideal scenario, you know, we have this really quarterly and then you know, I think one of the big benefits is just that people can see the process at work uh, as they're on their screens, can maybe, you know, follow along with it. And then over time, you know, can join these meetings as well to get more Q&A. Um, I think we should do a little video of sign up. That'd be a good idea. So it, you know, it's all, all working beforehand. And if we do it quarterly, then the next one will be July after the conference. So it would be a good uh, kind of jump off point to discuss what we did at the conference, right? Oh, I love that. Okay, very cool. And, you know, I think one thing, um, an interesting bit is also having sign up buddies. Um, and, you know, that's probably more uh, an in-person thing, but, um, but we can discuss that too. Okay. Well, thank you uh, very, very much uh, to both uh, Max and Emil. Um, uh, yeah, I'm very super fortunate to have you guys here. I think, you know, Quranix, whenever you have any witness points just want to spend on anything, I usually spend them on Quranix. I think it's the number one thing that people, you know, are gradually waking up to the importance thereof. Uh, I think we're still early, uh, early stage um, and, and there's a lot of possibility in the space. I'm very, very glad that you guys made it here. Um, and uh, I should say, maybe uh, as, as a final bit, um, where can people, if they struggle, right, and they don't want to wait into the next time of salons, uh, what do they do? Is there like a, an easy helpline or something similar where people can go? 
Yes. So, so for, for us, um, there, on our webpage, there's multiple buttons called schedule consultation, um, which is totally, you know, you don't need to sign up. It's just about, you know, I want to learn more. If you decide that you want to sign up with another organization, we're more than happy to, you know, at least point your point you what's the right direction as well. So, um, it, it can, it can start from, I'm just interested in this topic. I want to learn more. I have specific questions about the topic in general or us or whatever. Um, or, you know, I, I want to, I have decided that I want to sign up. How do I fund it? Um, or anything in between those points. Um, so that is kind of the, the way, uh, the way to go. Um, yeah. Yeah, and for Alcor, um, you know, if you go to, to about, then we have the all the stuff there. And if you hover over the picture, you get email addresses. Diane Cremines is our membership person. She's been doing it for a long time. That's just uh, Diane at Alcor.org. And uh, she can answer questions. And, you know, for people who've come to this, if you have specific questions, I'll be happy to answer them too. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, with that, I'll let you go. Thanks for staying on a little bit longer, but I I'm already very excited for the next one and uh, I'll be in touch about the video. Thank Alice, you. Can you, can you keep the call open? Cause there is someone, there was a German question. Um, yeah, absolutely. I'll keep it open. Cool. Okay. That, that works fine. Thanks Alison. Thanks a lot. And thanks for organizing and thanks for having me. I don't speak German. So I guess I'll drop off. Yeah. Okay. Well, I don't, I don't know if we talk German, but, but I don't know yeah. that there are other term life insurances, uh, term life insurances that are more affordable than, um, the one that we closely work with. And, and that's absolutely the case. So there are there are options that are that are more affordable, um, and they're totally fine. So so we have no. You can use any type of insurance that uh, that you would like to use with us. It doesn't need to be the one that we closely collaborate with. Um, the reason why this one is a bit is is a bit more expensive is so term life insurance is what they do. They invest the money that you do right. So so that you give them, and then they give you an automated discount every month um, based on the investment that they they made right now. They can theoretically always increase the amount that you need to pay per month um, if their investment doesn't go well. And the one that we have chosen is one that is initially a bit more expensive, but has an investment strategy that is more secure or more, you know, not secure, but um, less optimistic, a bit more conservative than maybe other insurances. Um, so that, and, th and then there are some fine print details that give a small advantage. So they have a higher acceptance rate and so on and so on. But if you're if you're healthy and and no no issues that um with with any you know medical pre-existing conditions then you can use any other insurance it's all fine um okay that's yeah. fine right um then the second second question this this code uh this, this discount code so this is just a test code um i think if anybody oh, right. uses it now it, it gives it, i think it now gives five percent or five euros discount or something on the membership fee um for the next i don't know months or so um um, so, so whenever, whenever we do these events, we have like some test codes and then these test codes later on become like smaller discount codes. If anybody joined the event, they have like a bit of a small advantage to signing up. Um, okay. yeah, if, if, and if you should decide to, to move to us, then of course we cover you. Um, so, so if, if someone, if someone is in Europe and then either is on vacation somewhere else or decides to move somewhere else, um, then of course they, they stay covered. Um, that's absolutely always the case. Um, either with, with local partners or with flight kits, um, or what you, you name it. Um, um, yeah, that doesn't make sense. Any, 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 any. Um, and what, what's the last question? They've had, uh, the contract I, in Germany, is there anything that you need to take care of? No, I think that's, that's, that's all. Yeah. So, so the only, yeah. the only reason why we decided to only cover Europe initially, right? So it's much better if you say, well, you know, a couple of our members moved to the U S and then, yeah, if, if one of those guys, you need to, you know, there's significantly more effort to do international standby and stabilization and so on, but mm -hmm. that's fine. If this only happens a couple of times, right? If this happens okay. in, I don't know, 20 or 30% of your cases, then you need to make sure that you have significantly more infrastructure ready to do international mm -hmm. cases. Um, and of course the U S is relatively easy right let's what what about japan or china or you know you know whatever south america and you know all the worlds all the countries and then you need to understand legal considerations in those countries and so on um mm -hmm. so um just the complexity level is significantly lower it just only happens a couple of times as opposed to let's say you know 20 or 30 percent of your members okay that's fine thank you absolutely don't go to china don't go to china yeah, we got, one, uh, we got one patient, but I'm sure we could do it again. It's, it's really tough. 
yeah it's, it's yeah. super it's super complex in some countries no but if you hey if you, if you want to have more and discuss more feel free to reach out i'm more than happy to take the time and, and discuss and discuss more and yeah if you decide then more than happy to have you as one of our members as well of course all right thank you looking forward cool i think now we covered all the questions i think yeah then Alison, max and, and kai see you soon um yep. either in in, in in san francisco or at in at alcor yeah looking forward to it same very much so yeah, and you're about to organizing the conference right right now all right <laughs> that's that's good <laughs> okay, see you everybody bye-bye